These two balls right here are printed from two different flexible filaments. One jumps around like a bouncy ball, while the other one loses a ton of energy every time it hits the base. Thermoplastic elastomers, also called TPE, are an incredibly underrated group of 3D printing materials with a ton of different properties. From super bouncy, to super tough, to super sticky, to super floppy. In today's video, I'll show you how to choose the right one for your project and how you can easily print them. Let's find out more. Guten Tag everybody, I'm Stefan and welcome to CNC Kitchen. Many associate 3D prints with being brittle and having poor layer adhesion. This can be true to some extent if you mainly print with the typical filaments like PLA or PETG. However, every once in a while I print a part or two in a flexible filament like TPU and am amazed by its properties. In fact, I even have a pair of incredibly stylish shoes 3D printed with flexible filament. These shoes are made by Zellerfeld and I've been wearing them ever since I got them at every 3D printing event. Zellerfeld is based based in Hamburg, Germany, and their mission is to bring 3D printed shoes to every foot in the world. They already have a farm of over 200 highly customized 3D printers to make this vision a reality. Zellerfeld sponsored this part of the video and they might be your ticket to get a job in the 3D printing industry. They're backed by the folks who helped to start Tesla, SpaceX and PayPal, and they're looking for talent to support their engineering team and their ever-growing print farm and platform. If you are a front-end back-end or full-stack software engineer or an embedded software developer with knowledge in 3D printer firmware and you're looking for a new challenge, check out Zellerfeld's job listings linked below. Even if your position isn't listed but you're passionate about using additive manufacturing for large-scale customizable footwear of the future and you have a unique skill, then get in touch with them. Thanks to Zellerfeld for sponsoring this part of the video. But what is TPU in the first place? TPU or thermoplastic urethane is often used as a general term for flexible 3D printing materials. Whereas the most common filament PLA is rather rigid and brittle, these flexibles almost feel like rubbers or silicones. Yet they are specifically different because as their name already suggests, TPUs, so thermoplastic urethanes, melt when you heat them and can therefore be injection molded or even 3D printed on our typical FDM printers. Silicones and rubbers on the other hand are elastomers, which means they are made by a vulcanization process in which the molecules crosslink, giving parts made from these materials their properties. This crosslinking is not reversible without damaging the material, so silicone and rubbers can't be molten or extruded. And this is exactly where TPE or thermoplastic elastomers come in. They are materials combining the properties of rubber with the properties of thermoplastics. So I just said TPE, so thermoplastic elastomer, not TPU as I did before. Where is the difference between them? TPE is the general term for this material group and TPU is a subgroup of it. Every TPU is a TPE, but not every TPE is a TPU. Just like every Porsche 911 is a car, but not every car is a Porsche 911. You get what I mean. So TPU is the most common TPE in 3D printing, but there are a ton of other types on the market as well, like TPA, TPC, TPO, and even some more. I even have this filament right here made from old tires I got from Polar Filament at Remurf this year. I have no clue what it is in details, but it smells horrible even without printing it. Don't get confused by all of the terms. One of the things they all have in common is that they are flexible, yet some other properties can differ quite a bit. In order to test and compare the bounceability, as well as a ton of other properties, I gathered a wide range of flexibles that I had in my studio, starting from extruders, flex hard TPU, to Fibology, Fiberflex 40D and 30D, which is a TPC, to the most haunted, super floppy 60A shore hardness TPU from Recreus. I can't really wrap my head around what to print with it. If you have any thoughts, let me know in the comments. Then I tested Filamentum Flexfill PBA, which is a TPA, which markets itself to be a really bouncy filament. And well, I'll test that. I also included special materials like carbon fiber and glass fiber reinforced TPU and Colorfab's Vario Shore TPU, whose hardness is adjustable by the printing temperature. What are the flexible materials you used in the past and what was your experience with them? Leave a comment below. 
If we talk about flexibles, we'll always also talk about shore hardness because this is the most common property of how you compare one to another. Shore hardness characterizes the softness of an elastomer. The lower the value, the softer it is. The two shore hardness ranges that are common in FDM 3D printing materials are the A and the D scale. A is for the softer materials and D is for the harder ones. To measure the hardness you push a penetrator with a given force into the material where the depth is measured by a special dial gauge. The deeper the penetrator goes into the material, the softer it obviously is. All flexibles usually give you the shore hardness in their data sheet, but I printed samples from all of the materials to see how they compare to my measurements. Once I had them all gathered, I tested each of them with both my hardness tester and noted down the results. The hardest material was the glass fiber reinforced TPU with 99 shore A and 59 shore D closely followed by extruders hard TPU. The medium hardness materials were in the 90A and 40D range and the softest of the materials Filaflex 60A measured 59 with my tool. And this nicely covers the whole range of shore hardnesses that we use these days in FDM 3D printing, which will be great for the upcoming tests. There was one special material, which is Colorfab's very short TPU, about which I did a whole video in the past. This material can vary its hardness by the printing temperature you're using. The filament comes with a foaming agent that will generate tiny bubbles within the material. The higher the temperature, the bigger the pores become and the softer the final part will be. I've been using this material for protective cases for example because it's super durable and leaves an almost fabric-like texture. For someone who has never worked with these flexible materials, it's hard to imagine what these values really mean. So I took some measurements on stuff that I had. My car tire was 64A, my flip-flop around 30A, and the outsole of my shoe was also around 60A. This already shows that the most flexible materials we can buy as a filament is just in that range where typical applications start. Yet 3D printing has one unique advantage, infill ratio. We can adjust in the slicer how dense we want our parts to be and therefore also lower the hardness below what a 100% filled part would have. By varying the density over your part, you can even adjust the hardness depending on the location in your part, which can be super handy for special applications like insoles or saddles. So I've already skipped a bit ahead because I printed the samples without even going into the most important point. How do you 3D print flexibles? Even though some of you might have already printed with TPU, TPE or whatever you want to call them, I'm sure many of you haven't. But if you follow some general rules, working with flexibles on modern 3D printers isn't as tricky anymore as it used to be. And with modern 3D printer, I mean those who have a direct extruder. I call the rules that you should follow the dab rules. Drying, adjustment and bed. The biggest problem with most flexibles is moisture and most of the people having issues with printing this material use wet filament. TPU loves absorbing humidity from the air, leading to a ton of stringing and bubbles on the surface of your print. Even if you use spools right out of the plastic packaging, they are usually too wet for printing. So drying your flexibles is a must because just storing them in a box with desiccant is usually not enough to drive all of the moisture out. I usually put them into an oven at 60 degrees celsius and leave them in there for around 6 hours. You can also put them into a dedicated heated filament dryer and I put links to some of them down in the description. After you get your freshly dried spooled out of the oven, you will need to keep it dry to prevent new moisture uptake and this is also during printing. This might sound painful and more involved than with other materials, but to get good results it's a necessity. Many dedicated dry boxes will let you print out of them directly or what I like using are these muesli container dry boxes designed by Mars Gizmo. If you make sure that your filament is dry, your print results should be super smooth with almost no stringing. Sometimes a spool of TPU will slowly pick up moisture again, leading to bubbly and stringy prints. In cases like this, you might need to re-dry the spools. Yet, if they are not fully saturated, slightly lowering the printing temperatures can already save the day. This part right here was for example printed at 245 degrees celsius nozzle temperature and looked horrible. But lowering the temperature by only 10 degrees celsius resulted in a perfect print. But how are you usually dealing with this problem and where are you drying your materials? Let me know in the comments. 
And this leads me to the next point, which is adjustment. Printing flexibles is a bit more involved than your regular PLA, because due to their flexible nature, they tend to buckle in the filament path, either blocking it directly or getting into any small crack that they can find. Yet you don't need to make rocket science out of your printing profiles. Default printing profiles in current slicers are usually a great start and will mostly only need slight adjustment to make them perfect for your specific material. The most significant difference to rigid materials is that you need to print slower. For my part, I usually don't play around with the printing speeds because depending on the layer height and nozzle diameter that you're using, this could mean totally different things in the amount of force that you need to push the filament. I usually use Prusa Slicer, Bamboo Studio or Orca Slicer. And all of them have a perfect feature for tuning and flexibles. Maximum volumetric speed. This is basically how fast you allow the extruder to push the filament and it's exactly what we need to limit when printing flexibles. Depending on the flexibility of your material, values between 1.5 to 4 cubic millimeters a second are a very good starting point. For hard TPUs, I usually start at 3.5 cubic millimeters a second, whereas for really flexible ones, I lower it to 1.5 cubic millimeters a second and adjust according to the results. And this is, in my opinion, the key setting you need to adjust if you want to print thermoplastic elastomers. The other setting you might need to tweak is the retraction length, which is often three times larger than on rigid filaments. Most default printing profiles usually already account for that in the filament override settings. So my Prusa Mark IV, which typically uses retractions of around 1mm, will require 2-3mm to three millimeters for flexibles. Yet, interestingly, many other default TPU profiles set that value even lower than standard, maybe to prevent the filament from jamming. I mean, if you have experience with tuning that value, let me know in the comments. Anyone else can check Modbot's recent video where he showed the process of tuning in that value. The final setting is temperature. So I usually start with the recommendations by the manufacturer. Since TPEs usually have great layer adhesion, you don't need to aim for the highest printing temperature. Printing a temperature tower is an option or just go for the middle of the temperature range and see if that already satisfies your quality requirements. Sometimes, especially with a slightly moist material, a difference of 10 degrees Celsius on the hot end can be the difference between an ugly and a great looking print. Yet don't go too low because at some point the material won't properly melt anymore, causing too much extrusion force and then jamming again. And that's it in my opinion for adjustment. No magic profiles, simply print a little slower, increase retractions and dial in your temperatures if necessary. The last point of dab is bad and I usually put a dab of glue stick on my print beds when printing TPU. TPU usually has a too good of a bad adhesion compared to many other materials. And if you ever printed it directly on your precious glass or PEI bed, you know what I mean. I ruined several print sheets already with TPU because it will rip chunks out of the print surface. Glue stick is a perfect separation layer. It still holds your part, but it will also let go of them without damaging the print surface. So if you follow dab, dry your materials, adjust your print speeds plus retractions and put a dab of glue stick on your bed, you'll be able to print beautifully with TPU, especially functional parts. But how functional are these parts and what are good applications for flexible filaments? To show that I printed more than the hardness test samples, but also tensile and impact specimens for mechanical properties. Finally, I also included friction and bounce pieces to find out which material is the best for your 3D printed tires and which are good for bouncing balls or even a dampening device. So let's look at the tensile strength and the stiffness of the different materials and start with Fibology Fiberflex 40D TPU, which is in the middle of the hardness scale. I always printed a horizontal and a vertical sample to judge the layer adhesion. Let's start with a horizontal sample. The test was very long and very boring because the sample just wouldn't break or rip. At some point I stopped the test because I came to the end of the travel of my test machine. The stress plot gives us two properties of the material, which is for once the yield point when the material starts to permanently deform. The second property is the stiffness, which we can estimate by the slope of the initial elastic region. It's hard to really pinpoint a maximum failure stress with these materials, because they are so flexible and yield that much. Which on the other hand is a good thing, because it shows how indestructible they are. 
So the horizontal specimen of Fiberflex 40D had a yield strength of around 7 megapascals. To put that into perspective, PLA has a yield strength of around 60 megapascals on a similar sample, making it almost 10 times stronger. Yet PLA breaks violently, whereas the flexible sample just stretched and stretched. The stiffness of the TPU was 140. Don't worry about the unit of this, we'll only use this for relative comparison. PLA on the other hand again has a stiffness of around 3000, PTG around 2000, so again the TPU is significantly softer. Well, it's uh, flexible, so what do you expect? We can see the other impressive property of TPU if we test the sample that we printed standing. They showed an impressive layer adhesion, yielding and yielding and yielding. These samples still snapped at some point, probably because the layers introduced natural notches into the part that will cause premature failure. Still, there is barely any other 3D printing material that shows this amount of yielding before failure, which makes it so suitable for demanding applications where you also require the strength between the layers. The strength itself isn't impressively high, with around 5.5 megapascals before starting to yield, yet the flexibility of the part will distribute the load over a bigger section and still prevent them from failing. And the comparable properties, regardless of the printing orientation, will make your parts really versatile. I then continued testing the rest of the samples, which was agonizingly boring, because each test took almost 10 minutes until I had to stop it. The general trend of the results was that the harder the flexible, the higher the stiffness was. The vertical samples usually were slightly weaker than the ones printed flat on the bed, but still very close to the ideal isotropic strength. The outliers were the fiber reinforced materials. Extruders Flex Heart tripled its strength from 9 to 27 megapascals, but also consequently lost a bit of its flexibility and broke at some point. The glass fiber TPU from CR3D was even more impressive, increasing its strength to over 50 megapascals, yet also losing its toughness. Yet one thing you always have to keep in mind when printing with fiber reinforced materials is that the fibers primarily align in the print plane and printing orientation and therefore also mainly only reinforce in that direction. So the layer adhesion samples were significantly weaker only reaching the strength of unreinforced materials. This behavior also translates into the stiffness analysis, where the fibers were able to significantly increase the stiffness, but only in the printing direction. If you plan to use such a material, this will lead to significantly different stiffness and strength behavior depending on the printing orientation of your part, so keep that in mind when designing. Yet the look of these reinforced materials is still really nice. The other materials followed the same stiffness ranking as the shore hardness ranking was. From wet noodle floppy with the Filaflex 60A to almost a similar stiffness as PETG on the glass fiber reinforced TPU. The rest of the materials were almost all at least an order of magnitude more compliant than PLA or PETG, which is the big downside of printing with flexibles. Whereas they are super tough, they significantly lack stiffness, which might be a problem for certain applications. Yet you can compensate for that in your design. If you for example double the thickness of a cantilever beam, you not only double the stiffness, but increase it eightfold, which can have a significant impact on your parts performance. Isn't that cool? Before we take a look at friction and bounceability, let's quickly check the impact resistance. Here a hammer with a known energy strikes a notch sample which will absorb a bit of the energy, which will reduce the height of the hammer it will swing to. So I loaded the first sample and it didn't break, but also didn't stop the hammer completely. This was due to the flexibility of the material and this even happened with the more rigid TPUs. Also the samples printed standing didn't break which again shows the good layer adhesion. This all changed once we got to Extruder's carbon fiber reinforced TPU. The horizontal sample was finally strong enough to stop the hammer and basically absorbed all of the energy without breaking, which is really impressive. The standing sample didn't fare that well. It still absorbed a ton of energy, but was the first one that broke. To put that into perspective, Here's a comparison chart with some other materials that I tested. We are on par or better with the most impact resistant materials that I tested so far. The glass fiber reinforced material broke as well, still with impressive values on the horizontal sample, yet lacked quite a bit in the standing orientation, yet still with values far above PLA and PETG. So even though regular TPUs really seemed unbreakable, reinforcing them with fibers makes them a bit weaker, yet still tougher than many other 3D printing materials. 
So let's get to the fun tests, especially the ones I haven't seen too much of yet. Friction testing and bounceability. So if you have ever printed a tire from TPU, you might have been a bit disappointed when it wasn't as sticky as you know it from a regular tire. But is there a difference between flexible filaments? So the friction coefficient is the ratio between the normal force pushing something down to the force that we need to get or keep something in motion. We distinguish between static and sliding friction. Static friction is the force that we need to overcome to get something into motion. The sliding friction is the force to keep it moving. Usually static friction is higher than sliding friction, but as we'll see, not always. To test this, I printed these standing friction samples with a lug. The part will be pushed down by a 2 kg weight and I'll attach a scale to the lug to measure the force during pulling. The friction coefficient always depends on the material combination, so it's not only affected by the material that we test but also affected by the material it slides on, which can make a significant difference. I did all of the tests on my varnish table, so keep that in mind. Your results may vary, but it will still give you an overall trend. Let's start with Extruder's flex hard material. It took around 0.7 kilograms to get it moving, which then dropped to around 0.6 kg once it was going, which leaves us with a friction coefficient of 0.4 for static friction and 0.3 for sliding friction, which is relatively low if you imagine how much friction a tire or a piece of rubber can have. Medium flex showed already more friction with 800 grams to get it moving and 700 grams while sliding. The semi-soft material got even more grippy and showed the anomaly of these flexible materials. It took 1.2 kilograms to get the contraption moving, but once it slid, I had to pull it even harder to keep it in motion. You could really feel how the material tried to grab into the surface once I dragged it over it, giving it that significant amount of friction force. And this also showed in the rest of the samples. The softer the material, the more friction it had, all the way to Filaflex 60A, which had a friction coefficient above 1, where I had to pull with 2.2 kilograms to get a 2 kilogram weight in motion. And once it started sliding, this increased to an astonishing 2.7 kilograms. So there is a reason why my car tire also was in that hardness range, which might be a good sweet spot of drag coefficient and wear. This is, in my opinion, a great learning. Even though it might sound obvious, I never really thought about it, but the softer a flexible, the more friction it seemed to have. Of course, you can generalize this, but there is a clear trend. Many of you might have already been looking forward to this last test. Which flexible filament is the most bouncy? Even though I'm a little late to the airless basketball party, I thought it might be a great idea to simply print some balls and then see how well they bounced. I initially thought about printing basketballs out of every filament, yet once I noticed how long that would have taken, I opted to print simple 40mm diameter spheres with gyroid infill to give them very similar stiffness properties regardless of the way they hit the floor. I added supports with 0.1mm separation gap which held the parts really well and yet was still okay to remove. And then I went to testing. I put a slab of concrete on my studio floor and then dropped the balls onto it measuring the achieved bounce back height with a ruler. The initial height was 78.5 centimeters, and Extruder's flex hard material was only able to bounce back to a height of 34 millimeters on average at the three drops that I did. This means that it lost 57% of its energy on impact. Extruder's flex medium and flex semi-soft materials were even more dampening, reaching only 30 and 25 centimeters of bounce back height. I'm really happy that I included other filament types because Fibology's Fiberflex 40D TPC was really bouncy, springing back to 53 centimeters, and the 30D shore hardness variant even only lost 26% of its energy on impact. Which shows that the hardness is not necessarily an indicator of springiness, but rather the type of TPE the manufacturer uses. Then I tested the contestant that I had the highest hope in, the PIBA filament from Filamentum, which is a TPA. It bounced back to 58 centimeters, resulting in an energy loss of only 27%, basically tying with a 30D fiber flex. Both honestly performed really well and even at very different hardness levels. The fiber filled materials on the other hand absorbed a ton of energy on impact, bouncing back to only 34 and 37 centimeters. The last interesting contestant was the fully formed up VarioShore TPU, the material with all the micro bubbles on the inside. Due to its form structure, it absorbed the most energy, 
getting only back to 25 centimeters after the first impact. I can't really pinpoint a winner here, because if you want a really springy or a really dampening behavior of your print is something that depends on the application. And this test kind of showed us the extremes, with very bouncy and very dampening filaments. So we have looked at the hardness, strength and flexibility, impact resistance as well as friction and bounceability of thermoplastic elastomers. I hope I was able to give you a better insight in the advantages and disadvantages of this material type and what you can achieve with different variants. There is no best TPE, TPU, TPC or TPA. It always depends on your application and thanks to the direct extruders being very common these days, printing them is not a huge problem anymore if you make sure that they are dry. In my opinion, TPEs are a highly underrated group of materials and could find a lot of use in functional applications where you need tough parts that can't break. You will have to deal with the flexibility of these materials, but clever design can help or innovations like carbon fiber or glass fiber filled materials. You can also embrace the flexibility of TPEs and use them for gaskets or living hinges. The only significant downside to silicones or real rubbers is the temperature resistance. Due to the thermoplastic nature of TPE, they will at some point just melt and usually at a significantly lower temperature than their elastomer cousins. Yet, if you know your boundary conditions, these flexible filaments can be used for some impressive applications and I highly recommend giving them a try at some point. If you want a TPE for some tough applications, you would have used PLA or PETG before, choose a rather hard one with at least 60D hardness. If you want the flexibility for gaskets or hinges, look at the ones that are in the 30 to 40D range, which is still rather easy to print. And if you're looking for a challenge and have a certain application, there's always Filaflex 60A. I put links to all of the materials in the description for you to check out. And now to the final question. How well does the airless basketball printed in one of the bounciest filaments we found really bounce? Even though Fiberflex 30D and the PIBA filament tight, I decided to print it with PIBA because it's significantly harder, which will make it more likely to not just collapse when bouncing it on the floor. Printing it took over two days and this at only 70% scale. Removing the supports was oddly satisfying, but it turned out a bit stringy, yet nothing that that some fire couldn't fix. So let's see how well it bounces. I mean, it bounces way better than I expected to be honest. It's not on par with a real air-filled ball and it has some soft spots that can get you really confused. For example, at the top of the print that just didn't print perfectly and where it lost a bit of its integrity. I guess, as many others have already shown with similar ball prints, the TPEs we usually use are just a bit too soft for this application. And after all of this testing, let me know your thoughts about thermoplastic elastomers in general. Have you ever used them on your printer? And if you did, what did you print and what was the most important thing that you had to learn? Leave a comment below. Thanks for watching everyone. I hope you found this video interesting. If you want to support my work, head over to Patreon or become a YouTube member. Also check out the other videos in my library. I hope to see you in the next one. Auf Wiedersehen and goodbye.